Um, good morning, everyone. I think it's still morning. Uh, my name is Prasanna Kanagasabai. I work for a company called ThoughtWorks. I've been a pen tester for a long time. Pretty much my, uh, I've been speaking at a few conferences in India. Started, I've just moved to Singapore, so I've just started giving some conferences here. Um, we also run a group called the Null, which specializes in uh, hacking and security on the offensive side and the defensive side. And uh, I'm one of the moderators on that one. I'm uh, available at, uh, on Twitter at at the rate Prasanna N. Uh, that's my mandatory introduction. Let's move to the actual talk. What I'm going to be talking about is um, uh, today a gentleman spoke, I forgot his name, sorry, uh, about different classifications of security. I want to concentrate on one specific one which is available. Uh, because it's a JavaScript session, uh, I wanted to concentrate on JavaScript. and. One of the most uh, craziest bugs that we see today as pen testers is DOM XSS. Things are changing a lot in the environments how we build stuff. Applications are moving more from very heavy server side to more client side also. So it effectively brings that, hey, we might have an attack vector inside the client side also. So today we have code that comes in, picks up information, changes at the client side itself, which could create, effectively create a DOM XSS. Uh, one of the important concepts on DOM XSS is source and syncs. We're going to discuss that also. Uh, what, because it's a pres what I had called this call, uh, sorry, a presentation, the uh, a pen testers perspective, I would be discussing some of the issues that I have found, some of the issues that others have found, and some things which are very interesting, some of that one. And uh, JavaScript being so huge and so much of data, we want to create some automation in there. And I wanted to work on a specific tool created by a friend of mine. And I would demo that too. Uh, uh, this was one of the recent payloads that I had created. Uh, this is actually a payload that gave me administrative access on one of the applications that we were working on. It's actually a file. It's a file name. Uh, this is what I'm going to be deciphering the whole thing and what is it, what happened, and stuff like that. Uh, before we get into it, a little bit about what is DOM XSS itself. Uh, most of the people understand what is cross-site scripting. Cross-site script, I'm not going to go too much into it. It's effectively wherein a malicious user could send some input, sent to the server, processed back, and comes back as is and played back on the DOM. It is effectively doing the DOM manipulation. But when a DOM exists, the data doesn't go to the server at all. So there is a component that is there in the client side itself, which is picking up this data and making changes to the DOM itself, which is why it was called the DOM XSS. The reason I like it is one of the reasons I love this thing is uh, there is no way servers can detect it. Most of the security mechanisms that people implement are at the server side. There's nothing at the client side at all. So you could have an exploit gone into production, and there is no way that a security administrator in the system can even find out about this, because the payload is never reaching him ever. Uh, just to give you a little bit of how a simple DOM access looks like, this is like a hello world of DOM accesses itself. It's a very simple thing if you really look at it. Uh, it's taking the location uh, hash, which basically is anything that you put after the hash, Slicing it, basically, so you, want, you don't want the hash, you want to take the content out of that after that. And you basically write a document.write, which basically would make a DOM manipulation. Uh, could anyone know what would be the exploit that if you want to do this, what, what would you send? Uh, a simple JavaScript, actually. Uh, you could write an image tag with uh, any, cr your traditional XSS would totally work in this scenario. That was that. I forgot your name. Sorry for that. <laughs> um, some of the most important concepts when it comes to uh, DOM XSS, we have two very, very critical things that you really think of, source and sinks. That's the simplest thing. What is a source? A source is a point of entry for a tainted uh, input by a malicious user. What it effectively means is these are places which a malicious user can send input into the application itself. As simple as that. And what is a sync? A sync is when you take this and manipulate the DOM. It's as simple as that. Um, so one of the fundamental things that uh, when I was learning security, probably 10 years back, a very good gentleman taught me a simple principle. 
Security issues can be divided into two sets. When data becomes code, you have a major problem, and when code becomes data. It's as simple as that. All security issues can go into these two lines. Effectively, if you really think about it here, most of the important component is there are ways, there are DOM APIs which allow that a user input, which is string, can be converted into a DOM component itself. That's where the fundamental co problem comes in. And this is where a DOM XSS is all about. Uh, a very good location of what are the source and syncs. I've just put up a very small laundry list, not the biggest one. I would actually suggest that you could go to the DOM XSS wiki. It has a more exhaustive information on what are the different sources, what are the different uh, things that are available. Uh, but if you really think about it, I want to spend two minutes here to talk about uh, some of the eval. Pretty much dead. Nobody uses eval these days. While in my demos, I have used eval because it's easier. Uh, but if you really look out, uh, set timeout and the function constructor can also execute code. These also can be used as DOM syncs. That's something that keeps missing out. And the eternal most important is the inner HTML and uh, outer HTML. These could be effectively be used to change your DOM, which is why it's a sync there. OK. Uh, now let's get into the actual fun of things. Recently, I was pen testing one of an application wherein we found a DOM XSS. But uh, there were two scenarios that were noticed here. It was basically said that the application or this bug is detected only inside an authenticated session. We take care of a lot of security controls in there. The application cannot be uh, put inside the iframe so that you can't do a cell phone-only XSS and stuff like that. So effectively saying that, hey, this is a very low priority bug here. Yes, we agree it's a bug, but it's not a bug. And the other thing that they told me was, we understand this is a file upload, which is what I showed you a few minutes back. And they said, it's a file name. What will you do maximum with this? All the special characters that you need to put inside a file name are blocked by the operating system. How would you even create an exploit around this? So this were the two challenges that, see, the, the problem was that the developers did not tell me it's a, not a bug. They told me, yes, we will fix this issue, but it's a very low priority issue. The problem with the low priority issue is it gets pushed off, and it gets slower to come in. And the application needs to go live, and I was worried that it could compromise. So I had to create an exploit. Uh, before we go to it, let me show you a demo of the actual exploitation itself. So I basically created a test application because I can't show you the actual application itself, uh, a lot of legalities and stuff like that. I can't show you the actual application. So let me show you a simple thing, uh, pretty much similar like this wherein a user could take a, a file name, and the file name was being reflected. So what the developer did was he just took the file name, he trusted it, and he just placed it on the DOM. And effectively, it created a cross-site scripting, which is the DOM XSS. But the problem now is the one that we discussed. How do you weaponize this exploit? This is where it came in. Let me show you something. Uh, how many of you know of an amazing tool called Beef? Uh, OK. This is Beef. Beef allows you to control browsers. It's an amazing tool. It's, um, when, uh, so a lot of cross-site scripting, when I do, people think that it's just alert boxes. It's not really alert boxes. It gives me capability to run execute JavaScript. That's the real problem. To prove a point, I wanted to show that, hey, I'm going to control your browser. So let's do this. So I'm going to take the actual exploit, run it. There you go. Everything about your information of your browser. If it's, I've, I've used localhost here, but it could be anywhere across the globe if, if it had gone to production. Thankfully, we fixed it after this demo that was done. Um, let me show you some. Let me show off a little bit. Do you see the CSRF token there? This was a Rails application. So Rails, by default, uses CSRF protection. So 
just by a cross-site scripting, I could basically capture that. What really was more crazy for them was the prompt. It would actually send messages. You can craft HTML. You can create whatever you want. Beef allows you to do anything that you really think about. That's the power of this one. Coming back to the exploit, let me go back to the presentation. OK. So if you look at this, how did I solve the problem? The two problems that were there, the application being internal, it also had one of the features that the administrators uh, of this application could accept USB disks from people, and they could have image files. And they had to upload these images, and they had to do some work with it. That was the functionality. So I had a way that I could take my exploit to the administrator itself. Second problem, how do you deal with special characters not being allowed by the operating system itself? Because I have to write a file and put it on that USB disk and give it to the administrator. How do you solve that problem? Again, JavaScript. If you really look at it, all I did was I made an exploit, converted it into base64, and used the A to B to do the job. So then I sent it to eval to execute. It's an as simple as activity as that. Uh, but in this, I found some very interesting things that came out of it. Eval generally is supposed to run arbitrary uh, string which can be evaluated as JavaScript. It did not work. It wasted an hour of uh, working with it. I realized that when you use eval in a file attribute, it does not work. So what I had to do was, if you look at the first one, I changed eval2 is equal to eval, and then executed it with eval2, and it simply works. So some controls that the browser started putting in could be just bypassed using a simple fix like that. Uh, that was what the first exploit was. Um, moving on. JavaScript templating engines. Uh, so these days, we have to work with a lot of templating engines. Uh, some of it are not necessarily uh, the top end of it. Sometimes we even come on scenarios where people have created their own templating engines. What are these templating engines? These are very simple. There is a piece of data that is coming in. It could be through a JSON. And the developer has basically said that there are patterns within that. He has written some patterns. The data is going to be that is received from the user or could be whatever method is going to be filtered. And then these placeholders are going to be changed. And uh, basically, this was a beautiful exploit by a friend of mine called Nafis Ahmed. Initially, found out by a gentleman called Mario. Uh, the links are provided there. So what this basically does is uh, there is some filtering, wherein the data is coming back, and there is some filtering that is there. But how do you bypass this filtering? That is what this demo is all about. Um, cancel this. So I have not written this piece of application into my bl blog or test application yet. It's still in my JS fiddle. But let's do this one. So if you look at this piece of code, it's a very simple thing. It's going to take the user's input. Uh, there is a placeholder here, which is, could be like your templating engine, which will change the placeholder. Please notice that there is a filtering that is done. The filtering function here is a standard filtering function, which basically will ensure that the data output uh, you put in. So basically, this is going to take a value and make it an image SRC. The data, if you notice, the placeholder is between two single quotes. So to break out of this context, you have to break out of a single quote. And then you can pass your standard on error or something like that, which will execute your JavaScript. But please notice that there is a filtering condition here, which basically says that if there is a single quote, double quote, or any of the angular brackets that are there, which are what are the ones that you need to break out of this context, are being removed. Now, how do you break out of this one? So let's just do a small demo of it. See this one? Uh, if you see this, it's basically saying image SRC into whatever value I pressed in and gone. Now let's say we try break out of this one. 
the standard one that any cross-site scripting guy would start with, something like this. Please notice, it is still within the single quotes. It's not gone out. How do you break out of this context? If you do not break out of this context, the filter is actually working. That means that the, con the control that the developer has placed is actually good and it works. But there is a problem here, and which is what Mario had pointed out, that browsers behave a little different. There's something called a mutation XSS, which basically means that, uh, how, let me show this one and let me then explain about it. Please notice the difference now. See what has happened. There's actually a difference in the way the output has come back. Last time, the data used to come within the single quotes itself. But this time, there's a small difference there. And let's click it. There, alert 9, which effectively says, I execute JavaScript in your context now. What is the, why was this happen? It, it happened because how JavaScript's string replace function works in a ECMAScript. The, it, most of the string replace functions take two parameters. It takes one input, the output, change whatever it is there. But ECMAScript and JavaScript are a little different. They behave a little differently. What, in this case, what it has done is when you put a dollar a backtick, what happens is it, come, it, mat, it returns back the string that it matched. In this case, the image SRC single quote, and it gives it back. And when we added the other components, we are effectively closing the whole single tag, uh, the whole image tag. And because it's a whole image, SRC equal to single quote, and then a error thing, the browser will basically render the image. It will try reading that uh, file that is there. Effectively, it's not going to get the file, so it's going to go into the on error and execute this itself. That was the whole point. See. The reason being with templating engines is what we notice is most of the time filters like this, which thinks that the context is within a single quote or a single with a double quote which cannot be escaped, it is very secure. But that's not the case. You need to know about how ECMAScript works, understanding how the string replace function, most of the templating is actually using a string replace functions. How do you basically understand how the system works there? Um, so that was what it is. I've given in some more information of where it is, and you could pick it up from there and uh, information on that. Moving on, this is another very interesting uh, exploit that came up recently with HackerOne. And HackerOne basically said, hey, we were affected by this. We gave out a bug bounty, and I forgot the gentleman's name who found it out. And there was a good amount of payment for this one. I found this very interesting because so when you see this, you really see the power of how browsers really work. Uh, let's get back to this one. So let me create a new blog. Please notice I've just created a simple one. Test, test, just one. And there is a link to something here, and that's what the idea is. And you submit it. If you see that, it's a simple blog with probably some references that are given or something like that. You click the link. Did you see any change? Look at the parent. The parent can be controlled. The parent was effectively 127.001.8000 port, right? I've gone and made it go to beef. I just as an idea showing you beef project. Effectively, I could have created a HTML page and exploited this guy with a beef again. But I didn't want to show that. I wanted to show something different, which is why I chose to use put the beef project itself, just to give you an idea of what can be achieved here. Imagine this, a fake uh, banking application 
All you knew it is you went to a blog, you clicked a link, and you see your banking. And with technology, our attack sequences like tab nabbing, which is you have so many uh, tabs open. I have multiple tabs when I work with. And you just put a fav icon there. It will look like you're into your Gmail or you're on an internet browsing site, something like that. On effect, you could be just giving away your credentials to someone else. How simple is that? Uh, that was the, the other very interesting exploit that I worked with. The one that also that I wanted to show on, on my last one that I wanted to show about was something called a window.name. What is window.name is one of the very unique properties. Um, how many of you know it's actually a cross domain accessible property? Okay. Uh, do you see a risk because of this? Yahoo had a huge DOM XSS a long time back using this PM specific one. It's fixed at this moment. It doesn't have it anymore. But just using a window.name. Let me show you a demo. It's a very simple one. Ah, by the way, I, oh, before I go into this one, I forgot that I didn't show you what I did with the previous one. Uh, the previous one, it's as simple as this. It was again using a window.opener.location property. What I did was I just have, so once it landed on the uh, attacker's page, it said that change the opener, the opener in this case being the parent itself. So effectively you can use this, a child could basically change how the parent would behave. That is what the previous one was. Sorry, I didn't show you the last time. The new one that I wanted to show you about is a very simple one, something like this. Wherein here what we're gonna do is we're gonna open a window itself or use uh, JavaScript's window.open to open another child uh, case in this case. So the last time we were at the blog page and we opened another application, this time we are gonna be at the uh, attacker page and we are gonna use the uh, blog as my uh, victim. I'm just going to close this, go back here. There. Please notice here, uh, the page at 127.8000 is saying that hello to 9080. It was 9080 which opened up this insecure blog, right? So effectively information that the 9080 domain set was read by um, the insecure blog which is running on port 8000. Uh, the re though it is different, uh, same 127.0.0, uh, but I'm sure most of you understand what same origin policy is and it is different domains. It's effectively considered a different domain. Uh, so data communication between the two are controlled and restricted. And effectively what we did was we used this component here to basically say that I'm, I, I, as a user, I'm going to give you some data. Now, you, as a, uh, a user, is basically going to take this data and convert this or read this data and, sorry, I lost a few thoughts there. I was just looking at the time. Um, so what it basically is, let me just go into this and show you how it actually happened. As simple as that. If you look at it, even the Yahoo exploit had a similar one. Two functions. If you, if you think of it, what I did was, in the global space, it took an eval, the data was picked up and being stored inside a variable called tag. But a function called add also exists. It could be a very simple thing. The real thing in Yahoo, what it happened was, it was using their uh, ad-based uh, JavaScript, which was evaluating some components uh, before sanitization. And it also did, at, at a different function, the same object was being filled up with the value that is being filled in the top.name. Top.name is nothing but the same as window.name. It's just like an alias there. So effectively, whatever is there, you could basically exploit it with it. How do you exploit this? It's a very simple one. If you notice this, this is how I did. 
You do a window dot open. You basically set which URL you want to open, and you set the alert function or any JavaScript that is there, and it will magically get popped up there. Uh, this could be something that you could use to even do something called a DOM covering attacks. Uh, I probably don't pronounce it properly. What effectively it means is that when you can open an iframe as a child, the child iframe can set variables or global variables inside your parent. So imagine you have an application which loads an iframe. The child iframe could set saying that, hey, my flag is equal to true. What would happen is the parent has some control or structures which basically sees if the flag is true, do some operations. The child, which is an untrusted component, can do the similar attack and change values in the parent itself. That was the power of it. But you could see uh, with controls like X-frame options being in there, you may want to say that, hey, that risk is getting reduced. Now, uh, now that we spoke about all this, how do you, how do you automate these things? Uh, what is the thing that we, uh, the point that I, so JavaScripts are getting huge. Uh, today we have applications, let's say Angular or a Meteor, which is so huge. The amount of time that you, can you do this manually? Can you go and check every component? It's simply not possible. The amount of pen testing time we have is very less. But we do need to guarantee code coverage. We need to say that, hey, we are able to uh, at least, uh, at least to some extent, give some information saying that uh, we are able to fix some of these issues. How do we do it? Uh, the solution is, earlier there was a beautiful tool called uh, Domin. Uh, a, a tool by Stefano Di Piallo, but it's just that you have to pay money for it. I prefer to use Hookish, written by another friend called Nafis Ahmed. The reason I choose this is it's easier to use, free, what more can it be better? So it works by, all you need to do is, it's basically a Chrome extension. You go ahead and you put the application that you want say localhost, oh, let me just use 127 this time. And just keep browsing. If you keep noticing, it will start seeing all your sources and sinks and keep displaying it to you. See, if it like, look at it, it basically says that, hey, I see a document.cookie that is being set here, which could be picked up. I have a window.name, which is what effectively that application was doing. It picks up every piece of information. It, it basically how this works is he's hooked into every function that is there. And it's, please note, this is not being statically done. This is being dynamically done. It is at real time analyzing what information it is there, and it hooks into the actual function itself. So let's say if eval is there, it hooks into it, and it sees that what is coming inside eval. It also has the sources, it marks the sources, and, and it marks even the sinks. If it sees that a source that was entered is being detected at sync, it will say that, hey, I have a source and a sync detected together. And once you see it, it brings it out here, and when it detects that there is a DOM excess, the color changes. And that is one of the, a very easy way of doing some of these things. So as a developer, it could be as simple as that. You know, you run this application, you finish all your application, just keep running this tool, and run your, just browse through your application. It will start telling you what are all your sources that are there. It will also start telling you what are all your sinks. It also will automatically start evaluating to tell you where are all the, um, positive things that have actually happened. Where are the actual issues that have happened in this itself? The other one that we are, uh, as a pen tester, I like a lot is I can choose to put, um, let's say, window.name and say window.eval. And I can say, where are all the functions? It's still not evaluated it here. Basically, it, it will allow you to say, oh, sorry, one second. 
the output actually comes to your console. So when you say identify, you are effectively, what it will show you is, it will show you where all it sees that some source that has been picked up, and does it see a sync of that same input somewhere else? And it helps as a pen tester to say that, hey, what are all the combinations of data that are there? You have a chat with your developers. You basically say, hey, what are the functions that you're using? I can basically put those functions in here and quickly see so that I can guarantee some of these controls. It doesn't take away your manual pen testing efforts, but it, it helps you to uh, at least do a, some bits of it. Some of the other functions. So, uh, I spoke about DOM copywriting, wherein you can change the uh, global variables, right? You can use this to find out what are all the different global variables that your system or this page on the 127 is basically using. You can see that who is using them. If any changes that are happening, you can find them out from here. Um, but there are some known issues that are there. Like uh, I'll show you something. Uh, the same thing that I was working with doesn't seem to work when I use Okish. Uh, how do you figure that out? Is if you go to your thing here, it tells you what are all the things that are hooked on. You can even control some of these. These are the parameters that you need to work with. To Like in this case, uh, I might have to tune some of these things. Basic reason is my application has not been written properly. If you look at it, every time I go to the new blog, I have to refresh the page there because it's not properly written DOM yet. Uh, I need to make those changes uh, and tweak some of these things. Hokish should be able to help you there work with it. Uh, so. The insecure block that I have is something that I and Alex are continues to work on it. Uh, we are trying to put in as much uh, DOM excesses that we find. We try putting into them. We start dumping our. So the, the idea being is we want to learn ourselves. So we try writing our own insecure applications and try exploiting them. Uh, like I'll, the last one that I showed you about how templating engine works, the idea that we have is we could create something like an avatar, and which would update in real time an avatar there, which would have a simple filtering there, and you could bypass. That's the whole idea, and it's available again at my GitHub link there. That's all, pretty much. I have to talk about. And if any questions? Thank you, Prasanna. Like Thank you. What's the solution for that uh, uh, underscore blank issue? Ah, very good one. Sorry, I didn't talk about it. The fix is basically, before you do a redirect, basically set the window.opener to null. You set the window.opener to null, effectively this problem will be solved. That's the fix that HackerOne is using right now. Okay.